Hello, everyone. Welcome to the channel. We get a lot of comments on our YouTube channel, and I wanted to take the time to answer some of those with some video content. So let's go ahead and go to the list of questions, and we'll start with the first one. So the first question is, is, is the molecular structure of zirconia different than the molecular stru structure of titanium? Well, the question needs to be clarified a little bit. So titanium is a metal. Zirconium is a metal. Zirconia, uh, just in its root form, would be zirconia dioxide, which is an oxide. And then titanium, in an implant form, the part that touches the body is titanium dioxide. So titanium dioxide and zirconia dioxide are really what's touching the body. Now, with the zirconia, it's not actually zirconia dioxide. Normally, what they do is they add a little bit of yttrium. And what the yttrium does is it creates a more, a, a, a more strong version of the ceramic, okay? So they add a little bit of that. And then in the, in the titanium, what they do is they add a little vandium and a little aluminum to create a titanium alloy that makes it extremely tough. And remember, titanium dioxide in an alloy, like medical grade 23 titanium, is about 20 times tougher than the zirconia. They're both strong, but the titanium's tougher. So when you have a full mouth of zirconia and you want to add a couple implants in the first molar position, it can be rather difficult because when you take your comb beam CT scan, you're gonna have a lot of scatter. So one thing you can try to do is you can try to take the stickers that have the fiduciary markers in them and stick them onto the prostheses and see if you can get three-point alignment that way. Okay, that's, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is if the zirconia from premolar to premolar is a screw-retained solution, duplicate it. Scan it and duplicate it in plastic. And then you can do a dual scan protocol where you scan it in the mouth with some fiduciary markers on it and you don't have that scatter. I get a lot of questions about my favorite burr, which is my, my bone burr. And I like to call it the Stanley bone burr, but that's not what it's called. So if you call up Brassler or Messenger, don't call it that. But I like to call it that because I'm that fond of it. And let me explain to you what happened. For years, I'm doing all on X cases and I have to do some, some bone reduction. And so as I'm going through and I'm modifying the bone, for years I was trying different types of, of, of things, predominantly uh, burrs in the E-cutter family. And then one day I stumbled across this, bo this bone burr by Brassler. And it looked like just every other bone burr that, that, that's out there or just like any other E-cutter that's out there. And I tried it and it's nothing like any of the other ones. So let me explain. Most E-cutters, if you use an E-cutter on bone, they, they, they burn the bone or they snag the bone and they tear into the bone. They just, they just lurch into the bone and just cut it up. So you can't feather it. You can't, you can't paint away just very, very fine layers of bone. You, you get caught. So this burr made by Brassler, it's also made by uh, Messenger and also by Comet, is designed to not do that. It's super kind on soft tissue. So if you bump up against soft tissue, it doesn't tear the soft tissue, but it allows you to feather the bone and efficiently. Because at the end of the day, when we're, when we're modifying bone, we'd like to be efficient with it and it never burns the bone. So it's just the most wonderful bone in the world. If you have any questions, hit me up and I'll let you know what the number is. Someone asked me a question about the accuracy of guided systems. If you're using a type four guide where the implant goes through the guide, it has been my clinical experience that you will be within 200 microns of your desired position every time. If you're not, it was because you designed the case improperly. In other words, you put the implant in the virtual space in the wrong spot. The guide put the implant exactly where you planned it. If you plan it appropriately, it will go where it's supposed to go. So I have no concerns about implant placement. I trust my guides and have ever since we started doing it over 10 years ago fully with that. The second question I get is, what do I think about pilot guides? So a pilot guide is a type two guide, and you can reference my guide classification system here. A type two guide is a pilot drill, and I hate them. Uh, I find that a pilot drill is, is really more or less useless. 
And the reason is, is that after you drill the pilot drill as a 2.0 diameter and you're placing, say, a 4.2 implant, you have to drill the subsequent drills. You have to make the osteotomy bigger. And what happens is you make those osteotomies bigger. They get knocked out of position because they hit the dense compact bone and they slip into the, in, into the spongy bone. So even though you got the pilot drill in the right spot, which is great, the subsequent drills are then off. And then when you free and place the implant, it's off as well. So pilot drills, they're out in my practice. I only use type four fully guided drills. People ask me, can you do fully guided with an edentulous arch or with a big span and how would you manage that? And it really comes down to this. If you have a ridge that has an abundant amount of bone, okay, so it just has a big sausage roll of bone, a little bit of positional error with your guide is going to be tolerable. So then I would do, let's say we're doing a four implant overdenture on a maxillary ridge that has a lot of bone. I would do a tissue level guide. I would put the guide down just like a regular denture. I would do a tissue punch to the, through the soft tissue and I place my four implants. If they're off by 200 to 250 microns, it's going to be perfectly fine because you have abundant bone. The, the opposite of that is that you have an atrophic ridge. And when you look at it under the CT scan, there's no room for error. If you have no room for error, you need for your guide to be more accurate. And in those cases, we go bone level. So we would do a type four guide, fully guided, sitting on top of bone. So then that would require a full, full flap, full reflection, seat the bone, the bone guide on the guy, on the bone, and then drill your holes, place your, oste- place your implants, and close back up. I found the easiest way to remove an implant is placing the, the manufacturer's driver in the implant and reverse torquing it. The vast proponents of time were taking out implants because they were in the wrong position, which means that most of the time their bone to implant contact area is low. In other words, they're not all in the bone. Either they're too shallow or they're out the buckle, so that you don't have all of that contact area creating a great stability. So that's the first thing. If that's not gonna work because it does have too much bone around it, my favorite instrument is a piezo. And what I like to do is take a piezo and just drop it right down on the side of the implant, on the mesial, the distal, and the lingual. I always stay away from the facial because there's never a case where the facial has an abundance amount of bone and it's always so thin that you're worried about damaging it. And then after I created that space on on three sides, then I put the driver back in and I reverse torque it out. For our direct to multi-unit solutions, we have been using for the last year and a half or so, the Powerball screw. And we've had great success with the Powerball screw. And it opens us up to do a fully digital protocol, which means we can go from teeth to implant supported all on X and never have to build a model, not once. So when we use temporaries that are non-indexed, they can become loose quite readily, okay? Because they don't have a hex on it, so it's hard to get torque on it. And that's why we invented the S-wings. We invented the S-wings that allow us at the time of surgery to get preload on our abutment screw. And for instance, the BioHorizons abutment screw is preloaded to 30 Newton centimeters. So we can actually get 30 Newton centimeters of torque on a non-indexed abutment. Now that doesn't mean they don't still come loose, but it really reduces the incidence of that occurring. And that's exactly why we created the S-wings in the first place. What's better, an ash forcep or a straight forcep? an ash forcep. In fact, there's not e- it's not even a fight. It's not even a competition, okay? The ash forcep is the most effective tool at removing teeth, period. Any tooth, premolar to premolar, that looks somewhat like a cylinder can be rotated out of the avilus so readily and so easy with an ash forcep. The straight forceps, they don't provide you the mechanical leverage. They allow you to still rotate teeth out which is good because that's how you want to take your, your straight rooted teeth out. You want to rotate them out. Okay. Now don't luxate them. Okay. Rotate. And, but the, but the ash forcep conveys a mechanical advantage that I don't have time to talk about here, but I have talked about it in my extraction video. And if you just try it, you will love it. And the next time you see him at a conference, please buy me an espresso. This has been another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, the smile engineer, helping you re-engineer your practice every day.